Crew Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Crew Ooh Ooh Trime Crew Trime Crew Trime If you are new here, hello. If you are returning, nice to see you. Welcome back. I already said that. My name is Sarah and what I do here is tell you a terrible story to ruin your day. And I put on my makeup at the same time. So if that sounds like a fun combination, you're in the right place. So make sure you subscribe to this channel before you leave, hit the bell notification, and then you will never miss one of my terrible stories. Today's terrible story takes us to one of my favorite places. It's the birthplace of cotton candy, Mountain Dew, Moon Pies, and diabetes. I'm just kidding. Not the birthplace of diabetes, but it is the birthplace of the queen of sweet treats, Little Debbie, and how can we forget, Saint Dolly Parton. We're headed to good old Rocky Top. Rocky Top, Tennessee. <laughs> Tennessee. And this is the story of Thomas D. Husky. Okay, I feel like this one's gonna be long, so. Side note, if you are interested in any of the makeup that I use in today's video, just look down in the description box. I do my best to link everything that I use. Just click the link, it'll take you to the description. You just have to actually click the link to see what it is. And if what I'm using is not available anymore, I will list something similar. Okay. Let's get started. On February 27th, 1991, the Knoxville Police Department received a report from a woman who said she had been kidnapped by a man driving a blue Buick Elisaber. You can have my Buick Elisaber. And she had been taken to a secluded area on Cahaba Lane, attacked, and left for dead. Knoxville is in East Tennessee, right at the edge of the Great Smoky Mountains, one of my favorite places in the world, but the point is, it's the woods. So Interstate 40 is like the major highway that runs through that area. There's lots of big truck traffic. And Cahaba Lane is a dirt road that runs alongside Interstate 40 in Knoxville, and it dead ends in the dense woods. Right off of Cahaba Lane was a well-traveled path to a secluded area that was frequented by sex workers. It's not a campsite, okay? It's not nice. It's like lots of trash, bare mattresses, used condoms. I mean, it's icky. Well, the caller said that when the attacker got her there, he robbed her, like took her jewelry and money, stripped her naked, beat the shit out of her, and raped her. After the attack, he tied her up with some kind of rope and left her naked and alone in the woods in the middle of winter. She was eventually able to loosen the ropes and get free, and then she made her way to a local beauty shop where she called for help. Knoxville Police Department investigator Tom Presley took the report and later had the woman come with him to show him exactly where the attack had occurred. And when they got there, holy shit, they saw the blue Buick Ella Saber. Buick Ella Saber. So the woman pointed it out to Officer Presley and they went further down the path and then they found the man who attacked her. He was there again in action. This time there was a woman down on her knees in front of him um, crying. The officer arrested the man Thomas Husky. He was charged with rape and robbery and he spent a couple of months in jail waiting to be indicted. Okay, so the first woman decided that she didn't want to press charges and the second woman, the one that they had found when revisiting the scene, didn't show up in court. So without the testimony of the two victims, the grand jury did not indict. What? He was caught in the act by a police officer. I don't understand. So the reason that the first woman backed out is because she actually fibbed to the police. She was actually a sex worker herself and she had willingly gone to Cahaba Lane with Thomas to perform services. Not to be attacked and robbed, by the way. Well, she didn't tell police the whole truth because they didn't think that they would believe her and she was afraid that she would face charges for being a sex worker. Was she right? We don't know, but you know, it was 1991, so probably. Well, like I mentioned, Thomas had been held in the county jail, but when the charges were dropped, he was released. Only a couple weeks after his release, he was picked up on another solicitation charge after he propositioned an undercover officer for sex. 
he was fine and released. And we know for sure he had at least one more solicitation charge and he did not appear in court. So a capias warrant was issued. So in the state of Tennessee, when you fail to show up for court appearances, a judge will issue a capias order for your arrest, even if it's a misdemeanor. Well, what that means is anytime law enforcement would later encounter Thomas in this case, they know he's supposed to be arrested and brought to the Knox County Jail. Thomas D. Husky. Who was he? Well, there isn't much known about his childhood, but Thomas D. Husky was born on August 20th, 1960 in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee to Frank D. Husky and Jesse Helen Quarles. So his mother, Jessie, actually went by her middle name, Helen. She had three children from a previous relationship, so Thomas had two sisters, Wendy and Nancy, as well as a brother named Danny. As a child, Tommy was known to be a bit of a loner, and his family said he always wore a cape and pretended to be a superhero. When Tommy was a young man, he actually got married, it didn't last very long. They divorced pretty quickly, but they did have two sons together. The most interesting nugget, though, is Tommy's father. He was well known in the area because he trained elephants at the Knoxville Zoo for like 25 years. So Tommy actually worked at the Knoxville Zoo for his dad, you know, cleaning up after the elephants. And he earned the nickname Zoo Man. That nickname was actually given to him by the local sex workers because he would employ their services quite often and he would end up taking them to this like barn behind the zoo for their encounters. He also had earned a bad reputation amongst the sex workers because he became known as somebody who liked to tie people up and get rough. So they sort of spread the word to stay away from him. I also read maybe some conflicting evidence that for a time, Tommy Husky actually worked with Doc Antle of Tiger King fame. Lunatics are attracted to animals. No wonder he's a creep. That guy is a criminal too. Anyways, at the time of the arrest on Cahaba Lane when he was caught in the act, he was 32 years old and was living in Pigeon Forge with his parents. If you're not familiar with the geography of the area, Knoxville, Pigeon Forge, Gatlinburg, that's all sort of like close. I need to put on eyebrows. BRB. Okay, so Tommy Husky was arrested and then let go. But fast forward to October 20th, 1992, a hunter working on squirrel population control didn't know that was a thing, was making his way down Cahaba Lane into the dense woods at the end. And when he got to the clearing where the mattress and all the trash is, he found a rotting doghouse with a full-sized mannequin stuffed inside. What have we learned about finding a mannequin in the woods, friends? It's never a mannequin, okay? Well, he went to like sort of kick the trash aside and realized that it was actually the body of a dead woman. She was nude, blonde, had been severely beaten, strangled, and her hands were bound with um, orange twine. He left the area and called the Knoxville Police Department. And when the police got there, one of the detectives recognized the woman as Patricia Rose Anderson, a 32 year old drug addict and sometimes sex worker who had recently disappeared. So Patty's boyfriend had actually reported her missing. He'd last seen her on October 13th, a week before. So while police were investigating this not mannequin, they got a call from Tom Presley, the officer that had worked on that rape case on Cahaba Lane a couple years ago. Just a very, very similar scenario, except, you know, the women in his case survived and they identified their attacker as Tommy Husky. Well, Detective Michael Upchurch dug into Tommy Husky and he discovered those capias warrants. Hmm, you know, where Tommy failed to appear at court. So Detective Upchurch partnered with the Sevier County Sheriff's Department to arrest Tommy at his parents' home in Pigeon Forge. They arrived at 9.30 p.m. and Tommy was already in his pajamas. So as they were placing him under arrest, he said he needed, you know, shoes and socks. So Upchurch and a second detective accompanied Tommy to his bedroom. Detective Upchurch immediately saw orange rope on Tommy's bedroom floor and he knew that Patty had been bound with something very similar, you know, as well as other women who had recently reported being attacked. There was a lot, a lot of women. He also noticed on the dresser some women's jewelry items. 
interesting. So Tommy's dad gave him permission to search the house, but he said that if they wanted to go into Tommy's actual bedroom, they were gonna need his permission for that. So after a lot of back and forth with the Sevier County and Knox County district attorneys, Bruce Baker, apparently a magistrate judge for Sevier County, signed the search warrant. It was his first one ever. So they executed the warrant on Tommy's room. They took the orange twine, they took the jewelry items, they found a bunch of weird porn, you know, like torture porn. Patty's boyfriend, the one who reported her missing, would later identify those jewelry items as belonging to Patty. Uh, it was like a necklace and earrings. They had actually arrested Tommy based on those capious warrants. So they had to wait for a grand jury to indict on the murder of Patty. Tommy initially went to the Sevier County Jail, but then he was transferred to the Knox County Jail at 4 a.m. on October 22nd. He had his appearance in court later that day. He was fined and sentenced to 30 days in jail on the solicitation charge and for the failure to appear. Now, when he signed his charge forms that day in court, he signed Kyle Husky. Who's Kyle? I'm Kyle. Put a pin in that. We'll come back. So the investigators that were continuing with Patty Anderson's case needed to search the places that Thomas frequented, you know, like his house, the zoo barn, and Cahaba Lane. They believed that Patty had been killed at Cahaba Lane, but they wanted to check that barn at the zoo for other evidence. Unfortunately, that barn at the zoo had been demolished just a few months before in the summertime, and everything had just been straight up bulldozed, so there was just like nothing there. Now, as this situation continued to unfold, there were eight known missing sex workers at the time. And investigators started to worry that they might be dealing with a serial killer. Less than a week later, two more bodies were discovered on Cahaba Lane. This time, the remains were actually pretty decomposed. All that really meant was that it was gonna take them a lot longer to figure out who they were and what really happened to them. So in an effort to help figure out who these people were and what happened, the investigation enlisted the help of Dr. Bill Bass, a forensic anthropologist who started the body farm. So the body farm, if you're not familiar, is amazing. It's actually officially called the Forensic Anthropology Center and it's on the University of Tennessee. Basically, it's like a body donation program and they study how dead bodies behave, like how they decompose, how nature affects the process, lots of different things. It's awesome. If you wanna read more about the kinds of things that they study there, I highly recommend checking out this book called Stiff, The Curious Lives of Human Cadavers, written by Mary Roach. I'll link it down below. Great read. Anyway, so Dr. Bass was called in to check out the bodies as part of the investigation, like I said. And the first one was a black woman, partially clothed, definite signs of strangulation. She was later identified as 31-year-old Patricia Ann Johnson from Chattanooga. So Miss Johnson had not been in the Knoxville area for very long. You know, she had fallen on hard times and was staying in a local homeless shelter for the last few weeks. She had been seen hanging out in the areas where sex workers frequented you know, but had never actually been arrested herself. Dr. Bass commented that he estimated that she hadn't been dead long, you know, maybe just a couple days. The second body was another black woman. She was completely naked and badly decomposed. And Dr. Bass determined that this woman had been actually killed at the top of the hill, that they were near there on Cahaba Lane, and that animal predators had dragged her down to the bottom of the hill where she was more hidden by the brush. After some testing, they realized that her hyoid bone was missing. So he sent his students back out to Cahaba Lane to try to find it. It took them hours, as you would imagine, but they actually found it. So the hyoid bone is actually located in the front of your neck. It's the only bone that's not attached by another bone. It's like attached by muscles and it's vital for um, swallowing and speech. The reason that it's important in a murder investigation is that when somebody gets strangled, their hyoid bone is usually broken. So that's a sign that pathologists look for when determining cause of death. And turns out it absolutely was in this case, her hyoid bone, upon examination, had multiple stress fractures like you would get if somebody was strangling you. They also determined that she died sometime between October 9th and October 15th, 
which helped investigators try to narrow down their search parameters for like missing persons reports. They later confirmed that the woman was Darlene Smith of Knoxville. Last seen on October 14th, they matched her fingerprints and bingo bango. So by mid-October 1992, police had found three bodies on Cahaba Lane. Then on October 27th, Knoxville police found a fourth body. This again was on Cahaba Lane, but down the path a little further near a stream. So the victim's left hand was actually submerged in the water, but the rest of her body was mostly skeletonized. They learned that she was between the ages of 25 and 35. She had a large fracture to her shoulder blade that they estimated had to have been done with some kind of powerful force, like maybe she had been hit by like a baseball bat. And even though this was the last body discovered, it was determined that this was likely the first of the victims. And at this point, it's pretty clear that this was the work of one person. So that body in the stream was later determined to be a 30 year old drug addict and sometimes sex worker named Susan. East Stone. Okay, so meanwhile, Tommy is sitting in jail and the police are building this case on him as the prime suspect. And they interviewed him many times and he eventually did talk and confess, sort of. So the interview started out pretty normally and one of the investigators left the room briefly, but when he came back, Tommy's demeanor had changed a lot. He went from his normally quiet, almost docile personality to a loud, rude, aggressive persona and identified himself as Kyle. I'm Kyle. You're Kyle? Yeah. Prove it. All right. Hold on to your butts. So over the next few hours, Tommy explained that he has multiple personality disorder, or as it's now called, disassociative identity disorder. This is a psychiatric condition where the person creates others or alters who each have different speech patterns, body language, distinct names, behaviors, and memories, but they all live in one physical person's mind. This is very rare, but very real, and it's typically brought on by like extreme abuse. So these alters often perform like separate functions. There's a protector or maybe they hold painful memories so that the core person doesn't even know about it. So the core is not typically aware of the alters and because of this, they tend to lose time. So when an alter takes control, like they're in the driver's seat, the core person has no memory of it. Sometimes they'll wake up in a strange place and have no idea how they got there. And Tommy, in his case, said he didn't know what the other personalities did when they came out. He also said that he suffered from blackouts during these episodes, followed by severe headaches. So inside of Tommy, allegedly, is Kyle, who we've met, who hates Tommy. There's also a dapper Englishman named Philip Dax, who even speaks with a, like a British accent. There was also Timmy, a younger effeminate gay man, Jericho, and Larry. Now the alter we know the most about is Kyle. Douche. And he's the one who confessed to raping and murdering these four women. So Kyle actually provided information that wasn't public knowledge, things that only the real killer would know. He stated that he hated Tommy and he wanted to ruin his life and that's why he killed these sex workers. So Kyle described a lot of just very disturbing details surrounding the attacks and murders of these women and the details were very consistent with the evidence that had been discovered. The confession was actually taped and later the audio um, would be played for the jury when the case eventually went to trial. So a grand jury indicted Thomas Husky on all of the charges and since he was charged with four counts of capital murder, the district attorney decided to pursue the death penalty. Tommy didn't have money for a good lawyer, but in Tennessee, like many other states, defendants get access to the best of the best for their trials. And because Tommy was facing the death penalty, he was assigned two of the top defense attorneys in the state, Greg Isaacs and Herb Moncier. So the defense team went full speed ahead with pretrial motions, all designed to like slow the case way down. It worked, you know, they challenged the arrest, they wanted the confession thrown out, they said the search warrant wasn't valid, therefore all the evidence wasn't valid, they wanted the judge to recuse himself, they wanted 
wanted more money for experts. They wanted to change the venue because they didn't think he could get a fair trial in Knox County. They motioned that Tommy wasn't mentally competent to stand trial. All of it. Kitchen sink. Well, Tommy was found to be competent to stand trial. They did not get a change of venue, but they did bring jurors in from Davidson County, like a hundred miles away. But before any of that could happen, four survivors of attacks allegedly by Tommy brought their stories to police in Knox County. Unrelated to this case, but I guess related because it's the same assailant, these women described willingly going to Cahaba Lane with Tommy for sex work. Each of them said that as soon as they got their clothes off, he would tie them up with orange twine and just like beat the shit out of them. Their attacks were all very similar. You know, they were robbed of whatever items of material value they had, jewelry and money, whatnot. There would be a physical assault, a sexual assault, and then they would be left in the woods presumably to die. One of the victims was not a sex worker. She actually reported being grabbed off the street and dragged into Tommy's car. Blue Buick Ella Saber. Ella Saber? Why is that so funny to me? In her case, he actually took her to Chilowee Park near a large barn and he made her get out and undress and then, you know, he did the same terrible things to her that he did to the others. Well, Tommy Husky was actually charged for those crimes and he was indicted and taken to trial. He pled not guilty, surprise, but he did not mount an insanity defense. Also, by the way, there was no Kyle or Philip or anyone else present during that trial. Hmm. Well, those rape cases were done in two trials that took place at the end of 1995 and the beginning of 1996. The jury found him guilty of all counts, including aggravated rape and super aggravated rape. What is that? I don't know. Robbery and kidnapping. He was sentenced to 66 years in prison. Three years later, January 26th, 1999, the Zoo Man murder trial finally began. The prosecution attacked Tommy's claims of DID, you know, Dissociative Identity Disorder. They claimed that he was making everything up. They pointed out how the street that he grew up on was Kyle Lane and that he also was inspired based on the behavior they observed by, you know, watching soap operas like Days of Our Lives where the main character, Marlena, was possessed by a demon. Do you guys remember this shit? I don't believe that. You'd better believe it. <laughs> So crazy. So psychiatric witnesses for the state testified to the legitimacy of DID, but they said that they did not witness any of that when they were examining Tommy. 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 The defense, of course, had two psychiatrists testify that they diagnosed Tommy with this DID condition. And they also explained that, you know, during those sessions, Tommy revealed a long history of terrible sexual abuse, um, although none of the people that were named as abusers were ever substantiated. It's like nobody bothered to look into any of it. They just took it at face value. Now, I'm not saying don't believe people. I'm just saying in a trial, you need evidence. Tommy's ex-wife actually testified on his behalf and said that she remembers witnessing him losing time. But then a jailhouse snitch testified that Tommy had a copy of the book, Sybil. I can do anything. I can do anything I want to. In his cell. And he told him all about how he was going to pretend to be crazy like that to try to get out of trouble. So the jury deliberated for five days, but they were hopelessly deadlocked. They said that some of the evidence was confusing, you know, especially the timeline for the estimated deaths. Five of the jurors thought that Tommy Husky was completely sane and responsible for the murders. Four thought that he was insane and then therefore not responsible. And the last three just couldn't decide. Eventually, the judge declared a mistrial. The DA actually tried to bring the case to court again in 2002, but this is where things start to get really messy. So remember that search warrant from back in 1992? Turns out that the person who signed it, Bruce Baker, was not a magistrate judge. He was a city commissioner and he had no business signing search warrants. Also, it wasn't properly completed anyway. It didn't list the executing officer's name. So at any rate, it was invalid. So that means that all that evidence, the jewelry, the orange rope, gone. Also, 
The confessions were thrown out because apparently Tommy asked for a lawyer twice, but police continued the interview. So for my international friends, if you get arrested in the United States and you're in police custody, certain rights are activated. One of those is that if you ask for an attorney, the police have to stop talking until you get one. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, exhibit A. No more talking. Then there's the Capius warrant that gave police an excuse to arrest Tommy in the first place. It had errors on it too. So aside from this confession that may or may not have been given by an insane person, the rest of the case just fell apart and the murder charges were officially dropped in October 2005. Dropped. But Tommy D. Husky remains incarcerated. He continues to serve his 66-year sentence for the rape cases at the South Central Correctional Facility in Clifton, Tennessee. That sentence concludes on November 9th, 2056, so at that time he will be 95 years old if he lives that long. And that is the story of Thomas D. Husky. <coughs> Again, if you want to know any of the makeup that I used or similar products, everything will be listed down in the description box. Just click the link and it'll show you what it is. If you have a crew crime story that you would like to recommend to me, there is a Google Doc, a link to it. You just click it, it'll take you to it, fill in all the blanks. I would love to hear from you. Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you want to see more videos like this one, then consider subscribing to this channel. I upload new videos here on YouTube every week and you can follow me on all of the other socials as well. That is it for now. I will catch you next time in the next video. Bye. So aside from this shit, deliberate a bill. Psych, psych, I mean, okay. Tommy who's husky. I keep wanting to say husky. It's husky. Tommy Lee. Nope, not Lee. Motherfucker. To his. God damn it, Tyler.